So our society goes along saying that there's systemic racism, but largely denying the fact that the roots of that racism, if it exists, and in some places or many places perhaps it does, but it begins with the undeniable fact that the overwhelming majority of abortions performed in the vast majority of abortion clinics are in the black community by design. One of the men running for president of the United States wishes that schools would teach more about the Islamic faith and at the same time stands with those who say that there must be a separation of church and state so Christianity must stay out of the public schools. I could go on, but I think that I've made the point. Society is a mess. How did this all happen? What can we do about it are questions that we as Christian people should be asking ourselves, right? I'm not going to fully answer either of those questions this morning, but I do hope to address at least a partial answer to the last question, what do we do about it? Our text is found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. This passage of scripture years ago brought great comfort to my heart. I grew up in this association. I heard many, many preachers talk about if you're not winning souls to Jesus, you're just not where you ought to be. And I struggled with that. I worked with guys that were great at it. Remember as a college student going into Jackson, trying to witness to guys in town. I was terrible at it. The other guys were great at it. I was terrible at it. And I always felt like, boy, I just can't quite measure up. But these verses really helped me. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Discipling or making disciples has always been an important duty of the church and Christians in particular. I told you that this sermon was largely going to address the what can we do about the mess in our society question. However, I think a couple of statements concerning how we got into the mess are essential before looking at the solution. You see, Christians aren't the only ones who are supposed to make disciples. And we are not the only ones who make disciples. Marxists make disciples. Socialists make disciples. Muslims make disciples. New Agers make disciples, just to name a few. It seems rather obvious to me that the ones being the most effective in our country right now are the Marxists, or at least they're the ones that are getting the most attention. The basic philosophy of our secular universities for years has been Marxist. The basic philosophy of our, quote, Christian colleges and universities has been to pursue the American dream. While that, does not, while that does stand in stark contrast to the Marxist philosophy, it has weakened the call of Jesus to make disciples. The call is make disciples. The purpose of this sermon is not to debate this issue, so I'm moving on. Our scripture for today, for where we're really going to focus our attention, comes from Mark chapter 6. Now before I read the scripture, I want to just share a couple of things with you to express my view of Mark. In Bible college, I learned that Mark was one of the gospels, that Mark was just this, this active guy, and he kind of just jumped from story to story to story, and it was kind of like looking at a family photo book, whatever you call it, photo album, you know, a picture here, a picture there, and the highlights of Jesus' life. And perhaps that's true. But in thinking about this passage of Scripture and in studying this gospel over the last several months, I've come to the conclusion 
personally that Mark is not just giving snapshots of Jesus. He's running a full core action drama about the life of Jesus. And that every scene relates to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. And he's building a story that tells us that Jesus Christ is really the Son of God. That's what Mark does. Now, as we begin our reading here in Mark chapter 6, I want to begin with verse 1. So here we are in chapter 6, and we're stepping into the middle of this drama that Mark has been presenting. And this is what we read. He left there and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished. Where did this man get these things? They said, what is this wisdom that he's been given that has been given to him, and how are these miracles performed by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his household. He was not able to do a miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. He was going around the villages teaching. This scene should have been a one of tenderness and welcome. He's going home. But it's not. Why, why this pushback? I've asked myself that question, and I don't know all the, all the answer to that question, but it's fairly obvious that people ask the right question to start with. Where does this guy get this power? Where does he get this authority? But they ended up with the wrong answer. And because they ended up with the wrong answer, they missed who Jesus was, right? If they'd answered the question correctly, they would have found out who Jesus was, but they missed it. They flunked the quiz. So here he is. He's at home, the home synagogue. And they're offended because, why? They're familiar with his family. They knew his four brothers and at least his two sisters. Maybe he had more than two, but we know he had at least these four brothers and at least two sisters because it says they were sisters, right? So they knew all of his siblings. And they were just common, ordinary people like everybody else. So who does this Jesus think he is? So they viewed him as one putting on airs, elevating himself above the others, and so they were offended by him. My first point that I want to make to you today, and I want to spend a bit of time here, is that discipleship begins at home. In our country and in our neighborhoods, we have a serious problem with family. You can look up the statistics. They're not very good. I'm not going to give you statistics this morning. I'm just going to tell you the statistics of 10 kids that I had in middle school math this year. Okay? Three of those kids came from homes where they lived with their mom and dad, their biological mom and dad. All right? Two lived with their mom and stepdad. One lived with just mom. One was adopted. Two lived with their grandmother or grandmothers. One lived with an aunt and uncle. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm very thankful for every adult who took responsibility for a child. That needs to happen. It really does. I'm glad for foster parents. I'm thankful for grandparents that step up. Yeah, I'm thankful for stepdads or stepmoms that step in and help out. I'm thankful for those people. But the point is, the family as God designed it to be is broken in our society. There's no question. If in a Christian school, 30% of the kids live with their dad and mom, and 70% don't, 
What's it like outside the Christian squirrel world? I can only imagine. Okay? Now, what really bugs me about all of this is that for a large, to a large extent, the church is quiet about this issue. I don't hear much preaching much anymore on the evils of divorce. We've accepted it. It's what it is. But the Bible tells us that God hates it. Now understand me carefully. I didn't say God hates the divorcee. I didn't say that at all. I said God hates divorce. He hates divorce because of what it does to the people. He hates what it does to the kids. He hates what it does to one spouse or the other or to both. God hates divorce. He loves the divorcee. And if you're in that situation today, God loves you. He really does. But the point still remains, God hates divorce because he hates what it does to the structure of the home, to the structure of the family, what it does to the structure of society. And we've got to preach that message that God hates it. Now, when the home falls apart and fails to set the standard of where we're supposed to begin discipleship, where should it go next? Well, should probably go to the church, right? Doesn't that make sense? Well, what's the church doing about it? I don't know. Some places the church is doing some things about it. Some places it's not. But if the church fails to do its job, then where does it go? Well, the church has kind of relinquished a lot of its duties and responsibilities to the school. So what's the school doing about it? Well, not a whole lot. What have we done in our public school system? We said that God's not allowed. Right? So, our church fails to do the job, the home fails to do the job, the school fails to do the job, and we wonder why our country's in a mess. It's not rocket science. It's just what happens. See, the members of our church, instead of discipling its members, they're sending the next generation of leaders to public schools where pray, prayer is not allowed, Bible reading is not allowed. They go to secular universities and colleges where atheism is the theme of the day. And Marxist, perhaps, Marxism is perhaps the worst point of view, but that's where we are. We wring our hands. We talk about how awful things are. We blame the politicians and we express an utter helplessness in making things better but often fail to recognize that the world is the way it is because as a whole, we have failed to do our jobs. The blame lays right here in the church. So not only does discipleship or should discipleship begin at home, but our scripture lets us know that discipleship must include the church. Where did Jesus take his disciples? I know he took them to synagogue. But the best thing that we have in our society compared to synagogue is church, right? So discipleship must include the church. Unfortunately, when Jesus took his disciples to the synagogue at Nazareth, they ran into problems. Now, we would all be naive to say that the church has no problems. It does. There were four that are mentioned here in our passage of Scripture today for that this particular synagogue had with Jesus. Let me tell you, church, when we have a problem with Jesus, the church is in serious trouble. But these guys had a problem with Jesus. The first problem was a problem of familiarity and comfort. And I'm afraid, folks, that we too have a problem with familiarity and comfort with Jesus. We've become so familiar with the message. We're comfortable with the message. We're comfortable with the American Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. We are. And so, 
We become offended too easily when somebody really stands up for Jesus. And we call them radical. Right? We're too familiar. We're too comfortable. They assumed that Jesus was putting on airs. And we assume wrong things sometimes about a brother or sister who's really standing for Jesus. We're, they were offended. And sometimes people are offended by the truth. And that shuts the door to acceptance of the truth. <laughs> It reminds me of what happened to me once here since I've been to Mount Carmel. I didn't mean to offend the person, but in the course of a conversation, the person asked me if Mount Carmel was a King James Version only school. And I said, no. And the person responded back and they said, well, if the King James Version was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. Well, I could hardly believe that they said that to me. So being the bullheaded guy that I am sometimes, I responded with, well, uh, you know, Paul lived about 1,500 years or more before the King James Version of the Bible ever came out. And the Bible wasn't written in English. It was written in Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew. And the person looked at me. Like, I was way, way out there somewhere. I guess I am. When I didn't hit, fit that mold that this person wanted me to have, they were no longer interested in being part of Mount Carmel. Well, that was okay with me. Third so problem this synagogue had was a lack of belief. Verse 6 says that Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. When a church or person refuses to move out of the comfort zone and becomes offended by the truth, unbelief naturally follows. You know that? And when they get into that position where there is little or no belief, the very next thing happens, the fourth problem, and that is that even Jesus could not be effective. Did you realize that our lack of faith and unbelief can hinder the work of God? It can. It did here. Jesus couldn't do much there. Now, there's really an indictment on our church in this story. Do you notice what the summary statement is that Mark makes? He says that Jesus couldn't do any miracle there except he laid his hand on a few sick folk and healed them. Now, if God came down and healed a few sick folk here, we'd be shouting and carrying on like crazy. But notice what it says. That's just the little bitty things that Jesus wanted to do there. He was able to do the little bitty things, but he couldn't do the big stuff. Huh. I wonder how much stuff we're missing that God wants to do here when we're missing even the little stuff and God's got a whole bunch of big stuff for us. That should humble us. It really should. I want God to do the big stuff. Amen. I really do. Well, what do we get out of this story about discipleship? Discipleship in the church depends on fresh and new growth. Discipleship in and of itself is about growth. Someone has said that everyone needs an Apostle Paul and a Timothy in their lives. What do they mean by that? They need somebody that they're accountable to, that they look up to, and they need somebody that they're helping. And that's it. That's what discipling is all about. Being accountable to somebody and holding somebody else accountable. And I'm thankful for those people who discipled me. I am a much better man because of what others, how others influenced and poured into my life. And I have tried over the years to do the same for others. Number two, discipleship depends on truth whether it is offensive or not. And since Jesus defines himself as the way, the truth, and the life, discipleship without truth 
is not building the kingdom, but is building some man-made organization. Discipleship is always dependent on the truth. And it has to be that way. Discipleship must build faith. More specifically, discipleship must lay foundations for faith. Truth and application of truth in everyday life. Faith must not be this stagnant thing or theoretical thing, but it has to be active and living and a channel by which heaven interacts with earth. Do you understand that? It's by faith that we reach up to heaven and God pours out on us. And without faith, it says well, it's impossible to please God. Well, it's impossible to please God with because we're not reaching up to get what he has for us. Heaven's not impacting earth without faith. Before moving to scene two, I want to make a few statements that address the problems that are in this first scene. Remember that ineffectiveness, where Jesus was ineffective in this synagogue, ineffectiveness does not define your ministry or your discipleship unless you allow it to. Right? There may be times when you put out the best effort and you do the best you can and you might come back feeling like you've been very, very ineffective. But that doesn't need to define who you are. Don't stop there. Discipling others is a great way to overcome limited reception. If people aren't receiving you in general, get a few that will. Disciple them. Overcome that limited reception. New methods may bring better results, but the message doesn't need to change. And that's important. It's important for us to remember that God's truth is always true. And it doesn't change with the times. And solid training should produce solid results. Rejection in one place doesn't mean rejection everywhere. I want to share a story here. I think I have time to do this. There was a gentleman that started coming to our church because his wife came to our church. And his wife liked our church so much that she brought their son, their youngest son, with her all the time. And she started talking to her daughter and her husband about our church. And her daughter started coming to our church. And then her daughter liked it well enough, she brought her husband to church. And eventually, they convinced dad or the husband that he should come to church. And so, Mel started coming to church. Now, Mel was a very, very intelligent man. He worked for Caterpillar. And he was a parts man. And all the gold miners loved this guy. You've got to remember that in Alaska, you've got only so many months of the year where you can run your equipment. And then it just gets too cold, you can't do it anymore. So a lot of guys had equipment that was 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 years old. And they'd come into the cat dealership and they'd say, I need a part for such and such. Well, Caterpillar had digitalized everything. It was all on the computer. Except they'd only gone back about 10 years. So guys would come in wanting these parts for these old Caterpillars. And they'd holler at Mel. Hey, Mel, do you know the number for such and such a part on such and such a year Caterpillar? And he'd say, yeah, I think it's. And he'd tell them what the number was. Incredible. I don't know how he did all of that stuff, but they'd do that over and over again. They'd say, go ask Mel. Go ask Mel. Well, Mel was one of these guys, he was just kind of on the fringe of being a Christian. He wanted to claim God, but didn't want to do what God really wanted him to do. But as he started attending church, I noticed that as time went on, he started paying more and more attention to what was being said, what was preached. He started coming to prayer meetings. That's always a good sign. And one day he pulled me aside and he said, Pastor, thank you for investing in my life 
to make a difference. He said, I really have given my life to Jesus Christ. I don't know when he did it, probably at home somewhere, but Mel had decided it was time to be a Christian. His wife died from cancer, and he ended up just right in the, what seemed to me like the prime of his life. He slipped and fell, and his house hit his head on the counter, had a brain aneurysm, and died. But this great man decided that he was going to follow Jesus because somebody preached the truth to him. Because family members brought him in. Because family said, you should go to this church. And God reached him. See? Well, we move on to the next scene here in Mark chapter 6. And it's talking about Jesus commissioning the 12 and sending them out. So, um, I want you to look at the actions that Jesus took here. Number one, he summoned his disciples to him. And, and that's verse 7 says he summoned the 12 and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority and clean spirits, all that stuff. So he gathered them together. He sent them out in prayers. He gave them authority. He instructed them. Those are keys to discipleship, folks. Get together. Put together pairs. You, you know, it's always easier to do something with somebody else than it is to do it by yourself. Yeah, it's a whole lot more fun right? Yep. It really is. And sometimes we miss this in the church that it's just more fun. Let's that's, that's, that's do it in pairs. But God didn't just, Jesus didn't just do that. Notice he gave them authority. And when you're discipling people, if you don't start giving them authority, start giving them something to do that's meaningful and worthwhile, your discipleship will end. It will end quickly. You're right, Brother Brian. So he gave them authority. He instructed them. These four actions are the foundation for Jesus' plan to overcome the adversity he faced in Nazareth. The results are that instead of one person being out there giving the message, he now has six groups out there giving the message. Oh, yeah. So you're not going to accept my message? That's okay. I'll multiply my efforts. He did. Good stuff there. Good discipleship requires setting up our people for success. Don't ever try to send out those that you're trying to disciple with a task that's impossible for them to do. Always make sure that the first things you send them out to do, they can be successful at. And Jesus did that. He gave them the authority to do it. And as you read through the story, it comes back that they were just pumped up when they came back in about all the things that God was able to do through their lives. Now, notice some of these instructions that Jesus gave. Good discipling will address lifestyle issues. He talked about their food, what they should take, their clothing, their housing, their travel, talked about all of those things. Discipling deals with everyday life. Sure does. There's one more thing that Jesus did in his instruction that I think is important for us to remember as we try to disciple others, and that is good discipling will address potential problems before they happen. And Jesus is out there. What does he tell them? Well, you know, guys, when you go out there, everybody's just going to love you and accept you for who you are, right? No, wrong. You go out there and somebody doesn't like you, doesn't accept you, though they won't welcome you in. This is what you do. You shake off the dust from your clothes and you go somewhere else. Yeah. He addressed the problem before it happened. Now, we're human and Jesus is divine, so sometimes our discipling, we're going to miss it. But we're going to have to let those that are looking to us to disciple them, we're going to have to let them know there's going to be problems. You know, our church message here in America has basically become, if you become a Christian, everything will be just rosy, rosy, and fine, fine. And it ain't that way. I'm sorry, but it's not that way. 
there will be problems. There will be difficulties. And Jesus just sets it right out there. You know, you're not going to be accepted all the time. So deal with it. And here's how. Let's be followers of Jesus and try to do that in the lives of others. Effective discipleship, not only is it supposed to begin in the home, not only does it supposed to work through the church, it's also supposed to have impact. Is that right? So we get to the next story here. In my heading in the Bible says, John the Baptist beheaded. Huh? What kind of impact is that? Well, I'm sure that that was quite an impactful event. I mean, what would you think if somebody's ready to chop your head off? That's going to have a great impact on your life. And that's not what we're trying to talk about here, is it? No. There's some innuendos in this story that are very important for us to catch. And if we miss them, we're going to miss a large point of what Jesus is trying to tell us. Why does Mark put the story right here of the beheading of Herod? Look at verse 14. It says, King Herod heard about it because Jesus' name had become well known. How did it become well known? Jesus himself was doing things, but he had six groups of guys out there spreading the message, right? Multiplying the efforts. So instead of having one person doing it, there were six, and I think there were seven because I really don't think that Jesus just stopped because the other six were out there, right? So we've got this multiplied effort, and this multiplied effort got people's attention, so much so that even Herod heard about it. And so Herod... Um, Herod has this serious problem. And Mark tells us what Herod's problem was. He'd beheaded John the Baptist. And when Jesus came, comes on the scene and, Herod, and gets Herod's attention, what's Herod think? Oh man, John the Baptist is risen from the dead. That's what he thought. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. Yeah. Does our living, does our discipling impact the leaders of our community and of our state and of our country? Even though Herod had the total wrong idea of who Jesus was, he was influenced. He certainly was. He was convicted. John was this righteous man, and I beheaded him. Now, I'm not sure all of Herod's attitude, he might have felt relieved. That might be why he thought he was John the Baptist, because, oh, good. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to face that when John the Baptist is alive again. I don't know. Just throwing out ideas. The Bible doesn't tell us everything. As I read my Bible, I sometimes have way more questions than I have answers. And that's one of them. How did, how did Herod come to that conclusion? Was it to ease his conscience? Whatever. I don't know. But in all of this, we see in this story that people misunderstood Jesus. Some said he's Elijah. Some said he was John the Baptist. Some said he's another prophet. There are a lot of people who did not recognize who he was. But it didn't mean that the disciples were ineffective. It just meant people didn't get it. So in this scene, we find effectiveness and ineffectiveness at the same time. Jesus was popular. He was an everyday person's hero. He was talked about in the streets. People were swarming around him. 
if this were a fairy tale drama, if this were written today from the Hallmark perspective, you know what I mean. Yeah, everybody would have loved Jesus. He wouldn't have died on the cross. Everybody would have accepted him. He would have been the great success. Right? Not what happened. And Jesus' limited success should encourage us that we're not always going to win. Every person that we try to influence and disciple for Christ is not going to follow. But don't be discouraged with that. You know, don't be discouraged with that. They didn't all accept him, and you better believe I'm not as good at it as he was. And even one of the twelve didn't make it. So, people will misunderstand our message. Some will become convicted, perhaps like Herod, but unrepentant. Some will desire to see Jesus, perhaps, because of what we do, and I hope that that's the case. And we read, if you, go, if you go on into the Gospel of Luke and you go to chapter 23, you find out that Herod wanted to see Jesus. It says in verse 8 of chapter 23 of Luke, Herod was very glad to see Jesus when Pilate sent him over. For a long time he'd wanted to see him because he'd heard about him and was hoping to see some miracle performed by him. So he kept asking him questions, but Jesus did not answer him. And we know the story. Herod didn't get what he wanted, so flew with Jesus. All right. So to close out this scene and to start winding this thing down, I want to mention four signs of effective discipleship, and two of them may surprise you. Good discipling requires getting the disciples involved in ministry. We know that. You can disciple well, number two, but still have misunderstandings. In the Gospel of Mark alone, four times Jesus talks to his disciples, and he says something like this, Do you not yet understand? Yeah, if they couldn't get it from Jesus, chances of me convincing them is not real good. You can disciple well and still not win everyone. Good discipling, number four, will require times of rest and renewal. But as the next scene would reveal, you will not always get it when you want it. When you get down to the end of this scene, it says that Jesus tried to pull his disciples aside because there wasn't even time for him to eat. There are so many people around him. So Jesus says, let's take off and go somewhere else. Let's go rest a while. So they all get in the boat and where do they go? to the other side of the lake or wherever, and people see them leave. And they must not have had a very good motorboat, Brother Mike, because it says the people beat them to where they were going. Either that or Peter wasn't rowing very hard. And so they get out, and they're met with this whole mass of people. And rather than Jesus saying, go away, we're on vacation... He ministers to them all day long, and he meets their needs, and we have the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Yeah. Good discipling will require times of rest and renewal, but it doesn't always happen when you want it to. It just doesn't. Finally, effective discipleship is a team effort. And if we don't recognize that fact, we're going to miss it. You will never disciple someone all by yourself. Just won't happen. You might be the most important discipler in somebody's life, but you're not going to do it all by yourself. 
I'm reminded of one of the young men that came to me from another church. He was a military guy, kind of lived out on the edge. He was a Russian linguist that flew in the snoop planes back during the Cold War. And he thought it was a great excitement to fly in these snoop planes way up over Russia. And uh, he was the linguist, and he would be listening to the Russian air traffic chatter. And he knew when their plane got detected. And his job was to say, guys, it's time to get out of here. They know we're coming, and they're sending somebody after us. He said one time he just waited a little bit too long, and he actually heard them give the command to shoot them down. He said, our guys made some great maneuvers, and we got out of there, and uh, we didn't get hit, but that command had gone out. Yeah, he lived life out there on the edge. He'd grown up in a Christian home. But somewhere along the trail, he'd given up on it. Sort of. The first time I met him, he, we talked for about an hour. And he spent the whole hour trying to convince me he was a Christian. And I'm thinking to myself, if it takes a whole hour for somebody to convince me they're a Christian, they're probably not. <laughs> so I just tried to listen politely. Well, every once in a while for, for drill, they had to jump out of an airplane. He was in the Air Force, so every once in a while they had to jump out of an airplane. And he jumped and broke his ankle. He couldn't believe he did it. He jumped, I don't know how many times before, but that time he jumped and broke his ankle. He had to go in and have surgery, have it pinned back together. So he was off duty for six weeks. What's he going to do? Well, what he did is he read his Bible through in six, six weeks' time. And God totally transformed his life. Yeah, that's what God's Word does. And uh, so he started going to church and he started asking questions. I mean, he had hundreds of questions. And the poor pastor whose church he was going to had a lot larger, larger church than I did. And he said, man, Jeff, he said, I don't have time to answer all your questions. Kept putting him off. And finally, Jeff came to me and he said, Dave, he said, I got questions and I got to have answers. And he doesn't have time. Will you help me find the answers? And I said, well, I'll try. So he would come to my house. We'd dig out books and we'd get computers going and the software going and we would do Bible study for hours looking for answers to his questions. Then he would go to his dad. Dad, what about this? What about that? Tons of questions. But as he got answers, you begin to see him grow. Yeah, discipleship became a team effort. And I noticed that as he grew and as he got involved in ministry, then he just started discipling others. And when he was killed in a motorcycle crash and I got to preach his funeral, I have never preached a larger funeral or been to a larger funeral than his. Why? Because he had touched so many people's lives by just being who he was and saying, yeah, Jesus is real. And live in it. People were attracted to him. Almost every young person that talked about him said, I was his favorite. I know good and well that wasn't true. Because I talked to him when the kids weren't around. And there were some of them that actually bugged the living daylights out of him. But he would never let them know. Why? Because he wanted to reach them for Jesus. Jesus. And he was doing it. Yeah, church, we're living in a terrible time. But if we will take these very ideas that Jesus gives us about discipling, the next generation can be better than this one. America can be turned around. Oh, it might not be turned around to be the nation that it, we have known it to be in our younger days. It might end up being something totally different. But we can reach the next generation for Jesus if we will do it. 
Are we willing? Discipling's not easy. It means you have to put up with somebody else. All their foibles and all their weirdness and all those things. But we can do it. Together, we can do it. Are you committed this morning? Are you? Do you want to see our world change? Yeah, this is how you do it. This is how you do it. Yeah, I appreciate the evangelists that come and minister and help dig people out of the rough and the raw and get them saved. But the way that we impact the world is by discipling it. So let's do it, shall we? 1 Corinthians 3, 6 says, and this is Paul's words, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. And I'm going to conclude with another verse of Scripture from Acts 17, 6. And this comes from the, from the life of Paul and Silas. When they were in Thessalonica, these words were written about them. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Now our world is upside down and so was the world in the days of Paul and Silas. And when Paul and Silas tried to get it turned right side up, everybody else thought it was upside down. And the same thing is going to happen with us. When we try to get things set right, people are going to say it's upside down. That's okay. That's the way it is. Would you stand with me this morning? Lord, uh, we've given our best, and our efforts may not have been as great as we would like for them to have been, but it's your truth, and we've tried to portray it accurately, carefully, truthfully, and we've tried to challenge your people to be effective today. Because, Lord, if we can't be effective today, the tomorrows are going to show a worse decline than what we have now. So help us to be difference makers in our world today. Help us to live godly and holy lives. Let us be attractive to people so they want to be like Jesus because they see Jesus in us. Lord, as we close out this camp tonight, we pray that your kingdom will be advanced and built Give us a great closeout time tonight. Be with Brother Mike as he preaches tonight. Anoint him. Give him exactly what he needs. And Lord, as then we finish camp and go into daily living again, help us to live you out. And be the disciple makers you want us to be. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.